Thank you. So I'd like to thank the, the organizers for inviting me to come to this meeting and to talk about it, some work that we've been doing over the last several years. <clears throat> and this is sort of a little bit of a summary of uh, perspectives towards uh, and relevance for climate prediction. <clears throat> and I'd just like to firstly acknowledge uh, my close collaborators on this work, Jin Barr, Jenny Mecking, and uh, Noradine Omrani. <clears throat> So I was thinking how to link up with the previous talks because the session was a uh, we, we switched from a uh, proxy data to uh, to mid latitude ocean and atmosphere interaction and so I thought uh, if I put this slide up for two reasons one is to sh because I think it's very important that we should try to and I want to s uh, strengthen the message of the previous talks we need more data we need really truth to understand what's going on in the North Atlantic sector uh, or, or actually globally on these time scales. So we see here a, a reconstruction that we were involved in, and the other reason I wanted to put this up is because it's, again, a marine proxy, and because we've used five records in a very similar way to what uh, was just spoken about. <clears throat> and we find the leading PC for Tropical Atlantic SST, uh, pay, pro, uh, coral records, which explains about 32% of the variance of the, of the data, gives you a very nice multi-decadal signal, and we have now essentially one more cycle from this data that we, I could say we could trust. <clears throat> but we didn't, uh, we're not brave enough yet to try to do what, back another 700 years, we don't have the data. <clears throat> so, well, that, that, that's sort of the baseline, and we need more data, actually, to understand things like the oscillatory nature of uh, Atlantic multi-decadal variability. So the things that I want to talk about today, uh, so I want to, there's three simple messages that I want to convey. The first I want to talk about atmospheric forcing of the ocean variability, and it's related to the talks we saw earlier in the day <coughs> by Tom Delworth and uh, Gokhan, and I don't try to say his surname, <laughs> sorry. Um, but the question I want to address here is how consistent is the slab ocean AGCM interpretation of AMV? So there's only three slides on this. And the second part, which is a, probably of more interest here, is, the, uh, is summarizing some work on the ocean forcing of atmospheric variability and, uh, in relation to NEO. And the last part is on maybe some ways forward in the decadal prediction community of how or things that I see that might give us you know, uh, greater improvements in, the, in doing our prediction work. <coughs> So I'd just like to start with this slide. It's a very common slide. It's been familiar to the talk. It's presented in a slightly different way here. So here it's a composite analysis, and it's done for the winter sea surface temperatures. It's a composite for Atlantic multi-decadal variability. On the left, you see the sea surface temperature. On the right, you see the sea level pressure pattern. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that the, if you do it this way, you don't really have this type of horseshoe pattern. At least it's not so prominent. It is much more like a monopole-like structure. And then we have a this NAO-like signal, negative NAO-like signal that is associated with these changes, so it's now becoming quite well known. And then, so this structure obviously cannot reproduce in, as a direct thermal forcing a horseshoe pattern, particularly in this type of region where the winds are of the wrong sign, they should produce a cooling. That's the sort of things that were discussed in this paper from Clements. So I would argue firstly that the pattern doesn't really match the pattern in the paper. The second thing I'd like to discuss is the, the stochastic null hypothesis that was put forward, <coughs> that it should be essentially an AR1, so slab ocean coupled to an AGCM. Now, we know the ocean is actually dynamic, and so we have, this is a very similar set of work that was shown uh, earlier today by Tom Delworth, except we're doing it in an uncoupled context. <coughs> and we, instead of doing a, you know, applying NAO time series of particular periodicities. We've applied a stochastic time series with a thousand, um, nearly 2,000 year length record. <clears throat> and so here you just see the, the spectrum of that and the, the wavelet spectrum of the things that we are going to drive this uh, <clears throat> half degree ocean model, a full ocean general circulation model. And so you can see a white spectrum. So what do you expect as the response in the ocean to these things? <clears throat> So here you see two very common indices that are discussed uh, throughout the, the talks. We see on the left the AMOC at 30 north, and on the right you see the subpolar gyre strength spectrum. Now neither of these is an AR1 spectrum because they have a, they integrate, it's the ocean dynamics that are integrating the stochastic forcing, so you don't no longer expect a simple AR1 spectrum. 
And in fact, the, the AMOC spectrum, the best fit here is an AR7, and for the Sapolo Gyre, it is an AR5. And uh, so they have quite different characteristics, as you can see. And what we have done from further analysis, we can identify sort of two different regimes in this state in the, the model. One is on the much longer time scales, sort of 100 years or longer, which is a sort of a quasi-equilibrium state, just in sort of quasi-equilibrium with the NAO forcing and involving a <coughs> thermohaline component. And then we have a more heat flux driven component in the in the sort of a decadal shorter time scales, which is very similar to the Saravan and McWilliams mechanism, or and it's a stochastic spatial resonance that's been discussed before. Now, if you look at the SST from the model, again, that has elements of both of these. This is Atlantic multi, multi Atlantic multicadal variability index, and again, it is not an AR1. So, I would argue that the the null hypothesis is not. Even though it, this is a stochastic climate model, it's not necessarily correct to assume it'll be an AO1 process. And the last, this, this was actually shown earlier today by Gokan, but in a different representation. So that region of the North Atlantic where you have, in, you would have expected a cooling based on the negative NAO-like structure, we actually see an outfluxing of heat. And this is shown here by the reconstructions that Sergei Gulev has done. And you see here the time series of a turbulent heat fluxes in, a, in green and the the SST reconstructions in red for that band here. And you see on these multi-decadal timescales, they really co-vary with each other. And the sign is such that it's the flux going out of the ocean. So it is not a region that is driven by the turbulent fluxes. So I, I think that sort of addresses that with the null hypothesis and it shows that the, the pattern is not really consistent with a, a slab ocean model coupled to an AGCM. <coughs> Now, so we saw the, po the possibility that there's a flux coming out of the Gulf Stream region. Right? So ha that has the potential to drive large-scale atmospheric circulation changes. And there's two ways that, uh, <coughs> that we can think about or, or revisit this question that has been uh, addressed for many years and what people have been looking for. So these days we have a higher resolution uh, models and we have higher resolution data and we see things like the sharp SST fronts and uh, <coughs> maybe the, the, the frequency of the SST data, so if we use daily data rather than uh, monthly data, we, we potentially get a much stronger response than what was found before. And uh, Mojib talked about this uh, earlier on Monday in a, when he referred to a paper from theirs on the North Pacific. So what, what I'm going to talk about is the, the bottom part, the role of the stratosphere, or the potential role of the stratosphere-troposphere interaction and the atmospheric response to the large-scale SST changes. <coughs> So here's a, uh, a, a, a schematic of the, not a schematic, sorry, a figure for the 1960s uh, warming, warm period, 1950-1960s warm period. You see the SST anomalies on the left that were observed. You see on the right the sea level, pre the geopotential height anomalies at 1,000 hectopascal. And at the bottom you see the response <coughs> in an atmospheric model driven by the observed SSTs. So you see here... The atmospheric model that resolves stratosphere-troposphere interaction well is able to reproduce the negative NEO-like structure with a quite reasonable strength, actually. And uh, the, the low-top model, the model that does not resolve the stratosphere-troposphere interaction, is not able to. We looked into this into more detail, and we see that it's really, uh, you, can get, you, you have a, a consistent weakening of the polar vortex earlier in the winter, and this is what is driving the, the, the tropospheric signals. Now, that was one case. <coughs> so how about... Uh, it's difficult in the observed record to look for more cases. So what we've done here is we looked in a high, a high top coupled model simulation. It is a more than 500 years of simulation. A very similar analysis. The left shows you the composite SST from the model. It has a slightly different structure. It now has a hints of this horseshoe pattern. The left is the geopotential height, but now at 500 hectopascal. 500 hectopascal. You see a negative NEO-like structure going along with this SST. Now, if you take that SST and drive an atmospheric model, the same atmospheric model, you actually reproduce the structures very clearly. Right? So we're able to reproduce those structures with the observed S the model SSTs in the North Atlantic only. And here I show you the stratospheric response. So here's the, the response in the coupled model, or, or the, the associated patterns in the coupled model of that SST, and here's the response of the uncoupled model. So we see uh, this is further confirms this mechanism which can be sort of schematized in, in this uh, figure here. So we tried to bring together various elements here of, of what we think is going on in the North Atlantic. 
So we have here a schematic of equator to pole, and here we have put a, a warming in the middle latitudes. The blue, the, the blue here shows you the, the westerly winds. You can see the troposphere and the, stratos, the troposphere and the stratosphere. Now, the first order effect of the, the warming in the high latitudes is, is to reduce the baroclinicity. So this will lead to a synoptic scale variability and will actually also force a larger scale planetary waves. These can propagate into the stratosphere. And if your model has a well-resolved stratosphere or it has no nudging in the stratosphere, it can uh, lead to a weakening of the polar vortex and a warming. So we can have a warming up here in the higher latitudes and a weakening of the winds, which are schematized by these uh, red dashed lines. And this signal that can then propagate back into the troposphere, enhancing further the, the meridional, uh, the low-level baroclinicity in the troposphere and leading further to a negative NEO-like response. Um, yeah. So there was, at the end, I will come to some further studies that uh, support this work from other groups. I thought there was here the slide. So now, uh, w w what, uh, what sort of insights does this give us to, to the prediction problem? I mean, it seems that uh, we may have a coupled, situ coupled, uh, a coupled type of variability in the North Atlantic, and in general, <coughs> climate prediction problem is a, a, a coupled issue. So just to, to start the discussion, I, I put up a, a schematic here, a conceptual view of the prediction problem. And the, each of these circles represents a differing uh, dynamics, different, different, <coughs> different representations of the predictable dynamics. So we have the observed, the observed well, the truth here, and the observed, observed climate. We have our model climate. So these are the free-running models. So these obviously differ from each other. We've been talking about that a lot. And then when we do a prediction, we actually introduce observed data. And by, because we are now, even in the most optimal way that we might try to do this with advanced data assimilation techniques, we will introduce uh, terms into the dynamics that will actually lead to a different representation of the climate, at least at the initial state. So the, you could say that the, the most the reliable part of this diagram is in this center. So to, to improve prediction, basically, we have uh, various strategies right? To uh, to, to get these circles to uh, overlap more closely and to, uh, to expand this blue region. So we can get a better idea of the mechanisms. We can also use data assimilation to, uh, to reduce, uh, to, to combine these circles. We can also use data assimilation methods, as I will argue, to improve our understanding of mechanisms. And together, by, co by collapsing these circles, we can get a better idea of predictability. So that's sort of a, a very conceptual view. So the prediction problem, I would argue, arises so if we start, if the starting point is the climate predictability, climate predictability arises from the interaction of the slowly varying components of the climate system with the atmosphere. So then I would argue that it's actually the misrepresentation of these interactions that is probably the major cause of error in our climate predictions at the moment. So these lead to errors in the mean state and the variability of the models in their free running climates. When we introduce observed data into the models, it leads to strong forecast drifts that degrade the forecast skills and the, these render the models actually a poor estimates of, uh, of providing us poor estimates of climate predictability or the limits of predictability. So I think that coupled data assimilation actually provides a, a pathway forward in this issue because you can, uh, you can consistently treat the dynamics in the different components, subcomponents of the system. And so you can, uh, you can reduce errors, I think, also in, in the mean, but in particular in the, in the forecast drift at the initial stage. And it's not, it's, I think you have to take, there are cleverer ways to do this than a sort of a brute force coupled data assimilation. I think if you, if you take into account the underlying predictable dynamics, then you, you have a better chance of dealing with this problem. And I just want to show the, the power of this type of method from some work that we've been doing in Bergen. And this is a, we're working towards coupled data assimilation. So far we have been doing a data assimilation only for the ocean. But here's a data, using the ensemble Kármán filter data assimilation method, we've been assimilating only sea surface temperature anomalies into the Norwegian Earth System model. And here you see uh, how only with observed sea surface temperature, we can propagate information into the, the deeper ocean and actually able to constrain the, the subpolar gyre strength in the North Atlantic. So the, the blue is our free-running 30-member ensemble. The, the, this pinkish line is after we have done the data assimilation of observed SST. And the black line is actually the observed sea surface height index of subpolar gyre strength. 
So actually, with only a sea surface temperature, we can propagate information through the covariances of, from the ensemble into the deeper ocean and constrain yeah, a large part of the variability that you mightn't expect. And I'm, I can see that this is a very powerful method to ex extend you know, information from, say, sea surface temperature or the ocean to the sea ice or looking at the atmosphere, land interactions. I think this has a, a really a great potential and we have to explore it. <coughs> And so just in summary, <coughs> I think the, the slab ocean AGCM interpretation of the AMV is not really consistent with our current understanding. I think we probably largely agree with that in this group. And uh, <coughs> I talked a little bit about observations and, and models and how that they indicate that the warm AMV tends to drive a negative NEO <coughs> and that the stratosphere plays a, a key role in this. I didn't discuss this, but in our experiments, we actually have quite some difficulty in reproducing the response to cold AMV conditions. We are able to reproduce the, the, the response to warm. We think that this is related actually to the background state of the, the winds and the westerly winds in our model are too strong, and it's quite sensitive to this. The last thing I would like to point out is there are now a growing body of work from other groups that are also supporting this, that the North Atlantic SST are actually able to drive a, a negative, well, influence the low frequency variability of the NEO. So thank you.